Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh. I am an integrative OBGYN physician, and I specialize in all things women's health, particularly hormonal issues, and definitely polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, the most common endocrine disorder of reproductive aged women, the most common cause of infertility for women. I was asked to discuss a very important topic, and it is, how does gut health influence PCOS symptoms, and what are the best and most effective ways to address this aspect of care for women with PCOS? Oh my goodness, I've been talking about gut health before anyone in the field of PCOS even understood the gut microbiome. And that is because I was introduced to this topic by my good friend, Professor Kelton Tremellen in Australia, who wrote the first paper back in 2012 on this topic talking about impaired gut barrier or leaky gut. It turns out that women with PCOS now pretty much universally have what is called leaky gut. It's related to gut microbiome abnormalities, what we call dysbiosis, dys meaning abnormal biosis life. So the trillions of microbes that live in the GI tract we call the gut are not actually optimized. You have wrong populations, you have lower diversity, you don't have the right mix of these critically important microbes. And why is that? Well, it's related to the fact that women with PCOS have suboptimal amounts of estradiol, too much testosterone, and that will have a big impact on the gut. In addition, because of the suboptimal amounts of estradiol, the estrogen made by the ovaries, there is a problem with the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls everything we don't think about, which includes gut motility, moving things along the gut. So when you don't have proper gut motility, you are going to develop things like gut dysbiosis, and then you'll have other conditions like what's called irritable bowel syndrome, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, acid reflux, known as gastroesophageal reflux, and the irritable bowel syndrome can be manifested as cramping, discomfort, and constipation, or diarrhea, or a mixed presentation. So these are all huge issues, and the leaky gut forms because you don't have the right microbes combined with our own cells to make a protective mucus coating that keeps the toxic contents of the intestinal tract from touching the gut lining. But without that protective mucus coating, because you don't have the right gut microbes to help produce it, the toxic chemicals made in the gut get right up to the lining cells, cause damage to the little fibers that hold the cells together, called tight junctions. And the cells start to drift apart, and the intestinal contents leak into the body proper. So what are the consequences of this for women with PCOS? Well, they have increased systemic inflammation because a great deal, in fact, 70 plus percent of the immune system lines the intestinal tract. And when these toxic products called endotoxins pass between the cells into the body proper, these immune cells burst with inflammatory cytokine production, creating systemic levels of inflammation. Now, what happens when you have this inflammation? that travels throughout the whole body. Well, it affects the cardiovascular system. Inflammation can damage vascular health. In addition, it can cause an increased risk of neuroinflammation, which can underlie increased levels of anxiety and depression and brain fog and insomnia. And what else? When you have high levels of inflammation, it can increase insulin and insulin resistance. And when you have insulin resistance, you make more insulin, which promotes fat production and storage. So women with PCOS have problems with weight gain and weight loss resistance. 
But it's even more complex than that because when you have leaky gut and you have dysbiosis, you have actual damage to the lining cells. And what's in the lining cells? Well, specialized cells called enteroendocrine cells that make that very now famous peptide called GLP-1. So that is so important for weight control. And the, the little enteroenterocytes actually start being damaged so they don't produce enough glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, which is what is in these drugs that are so popular for many women, including PCOS women, like Ozempic and Terzepazide, you know, the brand names like Wagovi and Manjaro or Zepound. Okay, so you probably heard some of these. These are naturally made peptides, which women with PCOS, because of their gut dysbiosis and gut microbiome problems, they do not make enough of it because they're damaged cells that make them in the lining. What else? When you have inflammation in the gut and you have the wrong microbial population, you have microbial dysbiosis, it actually communicates with the liver. And these toxins can travel to the liver as well. And you get higher rates of what is now called hepatic metabolic steatosis, also known as non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is really harmful to health. And because you have an abnormal liver, the liver makes cholesterol, it makes triglycerides. These products from the liver are produced in higher than normal or healthy quantities. So that's another big problem. In addition to weight loss resistance, even the lean PCOS women will have higher amounts of visceral fat and fatty liver, even when they're not technically overweight. They will have this abnormal amount of fat. In addition, when you don't have the proper gut microbiome and you have autonomic dysregulation, you will have more stress. So you have more sympathetic and less parasympathetic. And so that's creating a stress response, which can lead to things like hypertension and more anxiety and more insomnia. So you can see it's very complex. That's a very fast overview. Now, what about the treatment? Well, that's not as complex in a way. Eat a lot of plants, okay? Focus on a plant-based diet with lots of fiber foods. Fiber naturally will increase your own production of GLP-1. So it promotes a feeling of satiety and will increase GLP-1 to aid with weight loss. This is really critical. So I talk against a ketogenic diet. Now, I think that's a really bad choice, especially for more than just a very brief period of time because you're not nurturing your gut microbiome. Now, in addition to having a high fiber diet, now, what kind of foods are those? I said plants. Well, you want to have lots of legumes. That would be like beans of all kinds. And I'm sure you can love some beans, even if you don't love all beans. I happen to love all beans. So there's like pinto beans and navy beans, and there's um, black beans, and there's garbanzo beans. There's more beans than that, okay? There's so many kinds of beans, and you can cook them in so many ways, chilies and soups and with other dishes and in salads. I mean, just go to town with beans. And also lentils, another food that is often neglected. I love lentils. They're so tasty. Give them a try. And how about the ancient whole grains like buckwheat, like millet, quinoa, amaranth, and corn on the cob. If you eat white corn on the cob, it's not GMO. And that is healthy, okay? We're not talking about powdered, fine, you know, like processed grains or grains that look like flakes or little donuts or something. No, these are the ancient grains organic, and they actually increase your satiety. They increase GLP-1s. They help you with weight loss, and they do not make your blood sugar go high, okay? Now, what else is really helpful? Well, I want to make sure you eat lots of different kinds of vegetables, root vegetables, green leafy vegetables. Try to have half your vegetables raw, the other half cooked, 
across all the spectrums. You know, the alliums like garlic and onions. Don't forget asparagus, flatocruciferous vegetables. That would be like Brussels sprouts and kale, arugula, cauliflower, broccoli, turnips. Okay, so make sure you eat lots of cruciferous vegetables. They're amazing. They also have in them something called sulforaphane that is incredibly antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory. So go to town on all the vegetables. And here's another motto. Don't be afraid of fruit. Okay, fruit is not like eating sugar. We don't want to have any added sugar or high fructose corn syrup. That is not what fruit is like. You can have fruit with every meal. And that is including things that a lot of people think are not good for them, but it is good for you like watermelon, like cantaloupe, like pomegranates, mangoes, papayas, especially green bananas or the less ripe bananas, which are actually resistant starch. Of course, apples and oranges and grapefruits and summer fruits like peaches and plums and pears are wonderful. So go to town. Fruit has so much fiber and so many antioxidants and polyphenol. So don't be afraid of fruit. And nuts and seeds. Don't go crazy and eat like pounds of nuts, but nobody can. It has sort of a natural limiting factor. Have you ever tried to eat a lot of walnuts? You just can't. A small handful and you're done. But nuts and seeds are amazing. They have phytoestrogens in them. I didn't even get to talk about it. I don't have all day with you. I'm supposed to make this short. But phytoestrogens, which are in all the natural plant foods, They're like magical for our health and for our gut health in particular. So you want to eat all the different plant foods that there are, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, grains, all these different things are fantastic. And you really don't have to worry about overeating them. You kind of have a natural fullness and it makes you stop. By the way, I love what I call a breakfast salad all these different things in a giant salad bowl, and you'll be full for hours and hours if you have that in the morning. What should you limit? Oh my goodness, I know you know this. Alcohol, ultra-processed foods with all those horrible chemicals and high fructose corn syrup and other added sugars. No, don't eat those things. They're terrible for your gut. Terrible. You don't want to have any foods that like your great-grandmother couldn't eat, okay? You want to eat natural foods from the earth. If they come from a factory in plastic with lots of different ingredients, don't eat it, okay? Just don't do it. You know, you want to buy fresh, like farm fresh, even if you can't get to the farm, okay? Now, I also want you to do time-restricted eating. Like, try to eat most of your food in the morning or the first half of the day when you're most insulin-sensitive and your gut Motility is most optimized. Digestion is optimized. It will cause the least elevation of sugar in your bloodstream. The glucose and insulin will stay lower if you eat more of your food in the morning. Don't snack. Don't eat more than three times a day and eat your dinner early and have it small. Make sure you eat no closer than three hours to bedtime and try to have a 13-hour fast from dinner to breakfast, and try to have breakfast by two hours after awakening. When you eat is as critically important for gut health as what you eat. They're all important. As you know, timing is really important. And don't forget probiotic foods, fermented foods. My personal favorite is sauerkraut, but I also like kimchi. Almost any crunchy vegetable can be fermented, okay? So fermenting foods And of course, certain supplements can be helpful. Probiotics and supplements that aid gut health, like berberine, which actually is an antimicrobial and also, as you know, helps to regulate glucose. But a lot of that is because it's optimizing gut microbiome health. In addition, L-glutamine is very helpful. DIM, which you've probably heard of, an extract that I mentioned already from cruciferous vegetables, sulforaphane zinc carnosine, which helps to heal the gut, and another supplement called butyrate, which is a short-chain fatty acid, which helps to heal leaky gut. It also makes people feel happier and calmer. I also want to mention animal for just one second. Limit 
animal proteins. In fact, I recommend vegan for six months, not for life. And if you can't do that, have no more than one tiny serving of the healthiest animal protein you can get once a day, like three ounces once a day of animal protein. You'll get plenty of protein from the plants I mentioned. Animal is hard to digest. Saturated fat makes for leaky gut. And when I say hard to digest, your microbes don't like it, okay? They can make products like TMAO, TMA, and then the liver turns it to TMAO, which is actually a cardiovascular toxin. It's also bad for the gut. So limit animal protein, especially the first six months when you're trying to heal your impaired gut barrier and dysbiotic gut microbiome. So all of these things, a quick overview of why gut health is so critical and unfortunately abnormal in women with PCOS. And after you recognize the problem, now you know the solution. So I hope you found these helpful hints to be actually helpful because I want you to be optimally healthy. Women with PCOS can lose weight, can feel better, and actually can restore gut health. Thank you.